Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from New York, it is Wisdom. Welcome to Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast with your host today, Kastuba Das, living in desperate separation from my co host, Raghunath, who is somewhere in the mountains of Nepal, returning to us. Right, Mara? Yeah. He'll be back on the show tomorrow, hopefully, if he's got a good connection. Yeah, we're going to try to have him back tomorrow. Hopefully, that'll work. Um, but we have Balaram Perez, who's also in the mountains. Balaram, what mountains are you in over there? I'm in the Lake District right now, which is sort of 15 minutes from Scotland. Okay. The Lake District. What lakes have you got up there? It's just filled with lakes. There's, okay. there's like Lots 50 of. lakes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you go out there camping by yourself or something? Or what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So I've never been camping before. I mean... I, I did grow up in India and under like thatched roof bamboo huts, mm -hmm. but uh, this is like my second time ever camping out in the mountains. So really happy. And you just went out there by yourself? Yeah. Okay. Have you <laughs> encountered any wild beasts? What's, what's great about the UK is there's no dangerous animals here. Okay. So yeah, it's pretty any chill. Of those, this, any of those Scots of come sheep. down? Any <laughs> Scottish people come down? No Scots. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right everything's good though huh and it sounds like your connection is pretty good it's a little bit better than the tibetan mountain connection yeah it's a little bit better and, and actually i'm just remembering how last year i started tuning into wisdom of the sages from the mountains and i kept on having two sheep coming to like you know see wh what i'm listening to and i kept on thinking I'm gonna name these two sheep, Raghunath and Kastuba. <laughs> <laughs> have you? Have they come back? You, are they still around? When, whenever I go to that specific place for sunrise, they're always there. Oh, they're like two okay. sages just watching the sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go meet them someday. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're continuing with the Creative Sangha interviews. Balaram has a project called Creative Sangha, and he's been interviewing me. He's gonna be interviewing other people as well just to get, you know, thoughts that he'll, you know, apply in, in his creative endeavors, particularly in the realm of film. Um, so we, we've, we've gone through two days. This will be part three of the Creative Sangha interviews. Before we start that, let me just check in with Mara. Mara, do we have any announcements that we should share today? Uh, yeah, Tina Scheid, who's just back from Nepal with Raghu, is teaching asana class for our Patreon members at 6.30. She'll be coming with fresh realizations, I'm sure. Yeah, they've all been enlightened, so. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> um, and then there's also a Bhakti Recovery Group meeting at noon today. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so Balaram, um, why don't we just jump in? We've discussed so far, especially about, you know, the higher power, uh, you know, the, the, what, what uh, effect that can have one's, you know, one's, on one's life, the awareness of a higher power, and we kind of discussed that at length, and then also the fear of the higher power that, okay, you know, on one hand it sounds nice, but on the other hand I'm not sure if I want this higher power in my life. <laughs> and how do we understand that higher power? So we got into understanding the higher power both um, from a perspective of tattva, you know, like a categorical understanding, as well as from the... Uh, from the angle of rasa, like a very personal uh, 
loving understanding. And uh, what, what, what's next on the agenda? What are we going to talk about today? Yeah, first of all, I'm super grateful for everything that you've shared so far. It's really made me do a 180 on, on my thinking. So thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to ask you today about how we can find clarity in the complex world that we live in. Hmm. Um, just that simple. Anything else? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, yeah, I can elaborate. Like, yeah, a little bit. Specifically for, for um, this generation, uh, my generation and the next generation coming, there's so much noise. Right. Uh, you, you just like tune into social media. There's a million people trying to sell you ideas. Uh, and yeah, it, it feels like very bewildering. You can easily get lost in this world. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I just love coming to the mountains and getting away from everything. Right. Um, but yeah, specifically from the, from the perspective of Bhakti Yoga, how can we find clarity amongst so much noise? Okay. Thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, it's a great question. Basically, if you look at Bhagavad Gita, say, you know, which is you know, just such a standard book for yogic knowledge, and it speaks about so much about clarity. Because Arjuna, you know, he entered that conversation very unclear, very confused. Um, mm. so, so confused that he was actually kind of breaking down, which we see people, is happening to people quite regularly, you know, that I'm sure when I speak out to, you know, like our thousands of listeners, either everyone has had that experience or someone dear to them has had or is having that experience where people really go through, you know, whether it be a form of depression or, um, you know, s some sort of um, mental anguish, you know, grieving. Uh, th there's so much there. And, and so Arjuna was, you know, what an, what a, what an excellent book, <laughs> you know, Bhagavad Gita is. Because <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, it's part of this massive work, Mahabharata, which is, it, it, it's just so rich and nuanced in, in how it's presenting um, knowledge and doing it in such an entertaining and fascinating way and providing s inspiration on so many levels. But you get to that Bhagavad Gita, which is a book that sometimes the Bhagavad Gita is called the Gita Upanishad. It, in a sense, it summarizes the teachings of the, the Upanishads, which are presented um, in a more cryptic way, you know, uh, in, a, in a way that's a bit more difficult to understand. Um, Mahabharata's going to make it easier to understand, but Bhagavad Gita, in a sense, it, it's going to it's going to give you everything that you need from the Upanishads in, in these seven hundred verses, and it begins with our the the person that we've grown to love through reading Mahabharata, Arjuna. So he's you know that's what that's what a great storyteller can do is by sharing the qualities you know describing them you know by by hearing of Arjuna's qualities and seeing it play out in the stories of Mahabharata. By the time we get to Bhagavad Gita, we love Arjuna. Uh, mm -hmm. We identify with him. And when we, and, and you're, we're behind him, right? It's like, okay, you've been, you and your family have been so mistreated by your horrible cousins. And they've committed such evils and atrocities and they've taken over the government. Something's gotta be done. And you've taken your vows that you're going to come and rectify the situation. And, uh, and now you're there on the battlefield after 13 years in exile. And you're ready to do what you have to do. So, it, you know, it, it is great storytelling. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, and we were discussing this the other day, you know, that uh, Arjuna turns to Krishna, who's there with him, right? God himself, his Lord, um, the Yogeshwara, you know, the... the 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 master of all mystics and, and, and is there on his chariot. He's not going to fight, but he's with him, right? And, and and we're all like that, right? It's like God's not going to fight our battles for us, but he's with us. He's right there in the heart, right? And and now Arjuna has to step out onto his battlefield. And when he steps out there, when he he tells Krishna, please drive my chariot between these two armies now, so I can mm -hmm. see who it is that I'm going to fight. And the the um, the gravity of the situation slowly descends on him. That my beloved Bhishma, my grandfather, is on the other side, looking at me. You know, my beloved Guru, 
uh, Drona is on the other side. He's looking at me. So many other relatives, so many other friends, so many respected elders of mine are on this battlefield. They're all looking at me. My brothers are on the battlefield. My cousins are on the battlefield. And now everybody's looking at me. And what am I going to do? And um, in that moment, we read in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita how Arjuna breaks down, how he becomes confused. He's, he's cr tears are coming out of his eyes. His voice is, sh is shaking. His body is trembling. He drops his bow, his Gandiva bow. This is something that he carries with him, <laughs> like, you know, that, that, that bow is like an extension of his body. And it's with that bow that he's served. And it's with that bow that he's protected and carried out justice. It's, it's, it's his ability to use that bow that's gained him his reputation and his fame, um, his, you know, um, the respect that he has from everyone. And he drops that bow. And he cries. And he begins to express himself to Krishna in ways that are, there's, um, it's coming from his soft hardness and his good hardness, but it's also confused. He's become confused and he can't carry out his duty. And he surrenders himself to Krishna in, the, in, the, in that state. But, um, you know, in confusion, we become depressed. In confusion, we um, lose clarity. Right? We, we, we lose clarity. And so there's so much of the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna saying, Arjuna, we need to get you seen clearly again. You know, um, and w right off the bat, where the second chapter speaks a lot, and it, these, these instructions are so relevant to us, is that our material desires, they cloud our perception of truth. They um, disturb that clarity. They fog up that clarity. So you get this. There's so many instructions um, in that second chapter. There's a, there's a beautiful section where after, um, after describing uh, what he wants Arjuna to do, which is, he says, I want you to carry out your duty. I want you to fight this battle. Um, but I want you to do it with, with wisdom. I want you to do it with knowledge. I want you to do it with detachment. Arjuna is hearing these instructions, and his clarity is still not finely tuned. So it sounds to him like, like Krishna is saying, I want you to be this detached yogi who's, you know, Arjuna's like, I know the yogis. I've seen them out in the forest. They're not <laughs> fighting on the battlefield. They're out there doing their meditation and maybe doing their rituals, but uh, living their peaceful life. Um, it sounds like you're asking me to do that. And at the same time, you're asking me to fight this battle. To me, isn't that materialistic activity? You know, you fight to get wealth and you fight to get power and you fight to get reputation. And I, my, my realization and what I'm feeling profoundly right now is those things don't bring happiness. Um, they bring pain ultimately and the, they, they appear they appear to bring happiness if I had more wealth if I was more famous I'd be happy but what I'm feeling right now is I've got all that but I'm, I'm feeling nothing but pain um, mm -hmm. I want to be like the yogis so I like those instructions you're giving me but at the same time what, what's all this talk about carrying out this this battle of uh, you know being dutiful and, and all that in, in this context and Krishna's trying to share with him that there's a way to act in this world with clarity, like th with the yogi's clarity, right? Most people, are, when they're acting in this world, whether it's their duties to their family or how they're working in the world and what they're trying to gain in this world, commonly, most commonly, it's being done on one level or another in a state of lack of, there's a lacking of clarity. There's a misunderstanding that fundamentally, the lack of clarity is that my happiness is derived through the senses. Or let's say my happiness is derived through external things that I experience through my senses. That misconception clouds everything. right? Because once, we, once we've identified external things as the source of my, of my happiness, my contentment, it's going to put me in a world of competition. Uh, I'm going to have to in one sense, battle others for the resources of what I consider to be my happiness. And beyond that, there's the law of time, the force of time, which means that I'm going to become whatever, whatever external thing that I connect with as a source of happiness is, um, it, it's like there's a fuse that's burning on it and it's about to be destroyed. You know, it may be 
momentarily. It may be a few years down the road, but I'm going to lose touch with that source of that so-called source of happiness. Therefore, Krishna will say in the Gita that the the intelligent person doesn't take part in the sources of misery, right? Which you know, the, which come through the senses, realizing that these such pleasures have a beginning and an end. You know, the wise person doesn't take part in them. They're interested in something higher, something deeper, something called antasuka. Krishna called antasuka, a happiness that comes from within. So, what does clarity look like? You know, clarity means that as I move through this world, one, I'm not searching for happiness through anything external. Um, I have a deeper conviction that I can control my that if I can control my senses and stop running looking outside. We've used the um, the analogy of the musk deer, this deer that you know w runs the forest searching for this um, f uh, fragrance, this captivating, bewildering, you know, enchanting fragrance of musk. Uh, running, searching through the forest, trying to find it to the point of exhaustion, to the point of collapse, not realizing that the fragrance was coming from within its own body. So the yogis say, we're like that. We're running through this world, searching for happiness, searching it through, uh, whether it be through wealth or through um, sex or through whatever it may be, fame, um, money. But we're searching for it through something external, not realizing that happiness is our nature. It's within uh, we just, it, it, and if we, it, if we could slow down and stop searching for it desperately externally through our senses, we could find it within. So mm -hmm. that's, that's clarity. And that means having this conviction about antasuka, that happiness lies within. And, and realizing, ha again, being able to slow down, maybe spending a little time in nature, and especially hearing from these important yogic texts, recognizing that life itself consciousness itself um the atma is something that's eternal whereas my body my mind and the world around me is something that's temporary um but wherever i see life whether i see it you know in other human beings whether i see it in the sheep of northern england <laughs> whether i see <laughs> it in in the, in the grass in, in every blade of grass that's a living being every tree, every plant, every animal, every human, that there's a spark of spiritual energy there and there's an equality there, right? That, that every soul, we're, we're, that we all are the same, but we're moving through different bodies. So to be able to see an equality, this is called samadarshana. First we talked about antasuka and now we're talking about samadarshana, being able to see, see the, equal, the spiritual equality of every living being. Um, and with that knowledge, how, how that knowledge informs our behavior, how it um, brings out from us a sense of compassion um, for every living being. Or you could say like this, how it draws out from us the, um, the um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, the sacredness. How, how it helps me understand the sacredness of all life. Um, that's called samadarshana. So a person with clarity is, is they're, they're not becoming ruled by their senses or their mind, how the mind's been programmed. The, our minds through our, through our travels through this world, through our experiences, just like a computer can be programmed to respond to certain stimulus automatically in a particular way, our mind has been been program to respond that person's attractive that person's not attractive you know this person's cool this person's not cool this per this person is a foreigner they're an invader this per this person is one of my people right the the the, uh, the the person with clarity sees everyone as their as their people because we're all atmas like that so this um antasuka the samadarshana um and then Real important and really emphasized throughout the, the Bhagavad Gita is something called samadvam, even-mindedness. That understanding that I'm this spark of spiritual energy, that I'm in a material body that's, because it's material, it's always changing. 
that I'm in the material world, which because it's made of material energy, it's always changing. Um, that I've I come to terms with the fact that it's always changing, that my externals are always changing, but that I never change. And so with this, let me practice being steady, whether things are pleasant or unpleasant. My mind remains steady. My happiness, I don't become super elated when something externally favorable arises. I don't become um, depressed or confused or angry when something unpleasant or materially unfavorable arises. But I can maintain a steadiness not only knowing but anticipating the changes that I know will come, right? When you know it already and you're already prepared for it. Just like, um, you know, people that play sports, sometimes like say you play basketball or football, like American football. You know, sometimes what a good coach does is, is they say, uh, okay, maybe Mara, maybe they did this in your, your field hockey days. You let me know, okay? Okay. That the coach <laughs> says, we're going to go out there and we're going to run these plays and this is what we're going to expect to happen. You know, like that. And if this happens, we're going to go this way. And if that happens, we're going to go that way. But we know that there's going to be challenges that are going to come. So you kind of like mentally prepare yourself for what you know is about to happen or what can happen. The, the, the yogi, the wise person knows, I'm going to grow old. It's coming. It's coming every day. Am I going to become, am I going to lose my clarity? You know, am I going to become consumed by this and, and desperately fight against the natural aging process, which actually can be helpful for my realization, for, can, can be helpful for deepening my spiritual, um, the depth of my spiritual thought, right? Nature works that way. We grow old, right? We become mm. less sexy. <laughs> we become, you know, am I going to become confused by that? Am I going to lose my clarity or am I going to welcome that, knowing that it's going to come and, and have an even mind through it, you know? And knowing that, like, uh, we were just saying, we, we're looking at Balaram there and he's in Northern England and it looks like a beautiful sunny day. He's in a t-shirt. And, uh, and Mara's, she's up in upstate New York where like, I think the temperature is like 20 degrees right now, right? We've been having beautiful days and now it's shot down, right? So, um, you know, we know it's going to be hot one day, it's going to be cold the next. You know, it's crazy how much people talk about the weather. They just go on and on and on about it. They have 24 hour programs, about it. but you know, it's going to be, you know, every winter, like some snow comes and like, everybody's like talking about, oh my God, there's snow or there's a snowstorm. There's, yeah, of course there's a snowstorm. We know that in the winter it's going to snow and in the summer it's going to be hot, you know? Uh, but we, <laughs> but the yogis remain in even minded in the, in the, in the hot and cold weather, but in the hot and cold situations of life. They've got that summit from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this one verse in the Bhagavad Gita. There's so many verses in the Bhagavad Gita. But, uh, but one verse in particular, um, 248. It's, it's such a fascinating verse. And for the yogis out there, it's such an important verse because literally it, it's a verse that um, defines yoga. But that verse is, Yoga sta kudu karmani. Uh, perform your duty equipoised. You know, uh, yoga sta. You know, uh, fixed. You know, he says, "Sangam, sangam tyakta dhananjaya," um, abandoning all your attachments. Right, let go of your material attachments, Arjuna, um, because those attachments cloud our clarity. Because when we think our happiness is coming from anything external, we lose touch with the truth. Just like you know, politically, there's a concern that all these massive corporations are funding the campaigns of the politicians. So the clarity of the politicians' um, commitment to the people rather than to the corporations becomes clouded, right? Similarly, when, when we become influenced by our senses, well, then our clarity to understand truth becomes clouded. And so... Sometimes, you know, our, our attachments are so strong that we do the most foolish things. And people that don't have that attachment can see it, but we can't see it, right, because they're clouded. So he's telling Ar Arjuna, Arjuna, you're, you're, you're in such pain right now. You're, you're experiencing such a level of deep depression or mental breakdown, practically. Your attachments have you very confused. The answer of what, how you should respond, even though it's not pleasant in this circumstance, but because it's the right thing to do, it will lead to your, your ultimately your inner happiness. 
but because you you have attachments to ideas of external happiness you you're you become confused you were never confused like this in the past arjun i've seen you but i can see right now your attachments have you confused so perform your duty equipoised right um letting go of your attachments and then he said sidyo sidya sidyo samo bhutva whether city or city whether things are going well or not so well in victory or defeat right whether things seem pleasant or unpleasant some of uh, some old bhutva remain steady-minded you know remain steady-minded he says some of them yoga uchite such equanimity is called yoga right and hearing about this arjuna says this state of consciousness that you're describing is it sounds wonder this sounds like that yogi that i'm interested in Right, like that even mindedness, no matter what's happening, they're not disturbed. I'm very disturbed right now. My mind is disturbed. My mind is being consumed by by um very difficult emotions right now. Um, I like that. Can you describe this person to me more? He says, What are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? This is what Arjuna asks in text fifty four of the second chapter of the Gita. And Krishna replies saying that when a person gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification, when they understand nothing external is my, leads to my true happiness, because these all arrive from mental concoction. It's just the programming in my mind. It's not the truth. And he says, and when the mind thus purified, right now, it's, purified is another word for clarity, right? It's like now, now clear. When the mind thus purified and clear finds satisfaction in the self alone, my own nature, my own spiritual nature underneath it all, then they're said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. And he goes on to say, one who's not disturbed in mind, even amidst the, the miseries of this world, or elated when there's happiness, and who is free from, and, and he'll repeat this later in the Gita, attachment, fear, and anger. Right? Free from attachment, fear, and anger. That person is called a sage of steady mind. Right? Um, that, that, that is what we're looking for. That's called clarity. Um, Stita dir muni is the is the Sanskrit term for a sage of steady mind. That's what that's what we're looking to achieve. So, you know, it's through practicing detachment, regulating our lives. Like people here, you know, that we have so many people here joined us this morning on Zoom. Um, it's the senses will commonly tell us, don't wake up at five a.m. Right, it's more comfortable to lie in bed. But someone says, "You know what? My senses are programmed that way. But I'm going to regulate my senses, and I'm going to get up early." And although the senses don't like it, in the long run, it's it's drawing out my true spiritual nature from underneath, and that feels really good. So I'm going to control my senses. Right? I'm going to regulate my senses. That's how the stita dir muni, you know, functions in this world. That that. You know, this um, attachment, fear, and anger. I let go of my attachments. And when these fears come up, um, fear that I'm not going to get what I need, fear that someone's going to come along and take it from me, you know, fear that I, I'm, I'm not special enough, you know, as all the others, these kind of, these kind of confusions. Because, again, we have that antasuka, that happiness from within. We're, we're not confused that way. So I'm letting go of attachments, fear, and anger, right? I'm steady in my circumstance. My, I, I am fine. I don't need to become angered by the, how this world is moving and how this world is changing, feeling I've been, you know, that um, nobody understands me or I'm not getting the respect that I'm meant to be due or things like that, you know. Um, the the Stitcher Dear Muni, they overcome attachment, fear, and anger. Um, and it's from that platform that we're able to deeply absorb our mind in the spiritual content, in the mantras, in the sacred texts that, that transform one, that, trans, that, that purify the mind, transform the mind, and, and really allow us to tap into the, the, the sat chit ananda, the, the, our own eternality, our own knowledge, our own bliss. So that's, that's, that's standard. That's eternal truth. But your question, to, now, now with that background, you know, that Bhagavad Gita, Stita Dear Muni background, how does it apply today? I think that's where your question is going, right? Yeah. Uh, I, can I just reflect a little bit yes. what, what you were saying? What, what comes to mind is um, Krishna setting out 
our ideal situation, what our future could look like. And I'm sort of comparing that to the top of Mount Everest. (laughs) And I feel like I'm very far and I feel like I'm not even qualified to go up that mountain of Everest or (laughs) maybe not qualified, but I don't know how to do that. Um, And, you know, this this challenge that Arjuna had in, in the beginning of the Gita where he broke down, I feel like back in the day, people would call it like a midlife crisis. And I, it feels like these days we get that on a daily basis. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, we, we, we have this resolute purpose to get up early and, and do our japa before work. And 15 years later, we're like, yeah, we, we still haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and uh, I just wanted to also echo uh, from listening to your uh, conversation on the Arise podcast. Like how much respect I have for for your level of clarity and your level of detachment from from the world. It seems. Um, how did how did you get to that position, and and how can we also follow in those footsteps? Well, well uh, you know, I appreciate you saying that, but the fact is, I'm just like everyone else here. I'm, you know, it's <laughs> it's a battle for me. But but I I know, and, and my faith is strong. My conviction is strong that by walking this path um, with good association and regularly hearing, it, it is a Mount Everest in one sense. It is a Mount Everest. But it's also, you know, there's a way to climb Mount Everest. And when you, mm. you know, if you can connect with the right people, you know, and they can help you with, it, get you the right equipment, you know, you, you know, you can, you can climb that mountain. And, and so um, I feel like I've been gifted in this life with, very good teachers, very good mentors, very good friends. Um, and I'm just trying to hang on to them as, as, as together we, you know, we, we climb that mountain. But um, if we keep, ref- this is the teachings of the Upanishads and the teachings of the Gita. What, what, what um, later um, in the Gita, in the fourth chapter, Krishna is going to say that this reflection, seeing the world through the knowledge that we've heard. He, he calls this uh, jnana tapasa. It's the fire of knowledge, right? It burns away the, the, the just like when the sun rises, like it, it may be a foggy, like you're from England, there's a lot of foggy mornings, I suppose, right? And then at a certain point, the sun rises and the fog dissipates. And so in a similar way, the sun of the, of the yogic knowledge of the Gita and the Bhagavatam it, it it has that power to like to dissipate the cloudiness in our mind so that we can have clarity and if we and and it's for real in other words when i speak now i'm not saying this like it's some kind of i don't know grand idea that we talk about but do any of us ever really experience it no if we and and i think we get a lot of that response from you know the wisdom of the sages listeners every day we get really wonderful emails where people are saying, this has really changed my life, you know, and, and people say like, I want to thank, you know, you guys for doing this. What, what we try to make clear, and like we say from, from the first, I think the first uh, episode of Wisdom of the Sages, was, it was like the sages are in the pages, right? It's like, Raghunath and I don't claim to be sages, but what we're just trying to do is connect ourselves and, and, and help extend that to others to hear, to hear from these sages that are, that are there in the pages of these of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Could I add a, another layer to, yeah. to what you were just saying? Would you say that clarity is something that's attained through the, the Sangha of the devotees or reading the Bhagavatam? And and then that's it? Because that's sort of my lazy mindset. I, I just want to reach that, uh, okay. climb that mountain, reach that enlightenment, reach that clarity. <laughs> or is it something that we have to do every day for the rest of our lives? Well, that's the thing. That's the, you see, the point that I'm making, and this is what Krishna says, and this is what the Upanishads say. First, you have to hear, right? So we do have to hear from these texts on the regular, on the regular basis. That's going to begin, but, but the way that that hearing becomes especially potent is through our reflection on what we've heard. You know, I, uh, I mentioned yesterday that, uh, that uh, two days ago I bumped into an old friend of mine, uh, Anantagovinda. 
You know Nanta mm-hmm. Palmer? You've met? Yes. I lo- okay. He's my favorite Monongo player. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and devotee. <laughs> oh, wonderful devotee. Incredible Kirtan. I mean, Kier- it's just Kirtan is so good, you know? I remember one time in uh, Radha Govinda Mandir, we were looking for him to lead the Kirtan, and he was just washing the pots in the kitchen. Mm. He's like, nah, there's so many talent to devotees out there. And I was like, what? You're the best. <laughs> what I are know. you talking about? <laughs> when, when we were, when, so I, I bumped into him at the, at the Kirtan in, in Washington Square Park. Mm. And uh, he sat down and, and I was like, come on, lead, man. Everybody's turning him like, you should sing, you know? And he's like, no, 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 no. And then he had just a five minutes and he had to go. And we said, just lead, sing right now. He says, no, but, but he, he turned to me and said, but Kasuba, if you lead, Earlier, others were trying to get me to lead. I was like, nah, nah, nah. And he said, if you lead, I'll play Murdunga. And I said, okay. <laughs> you know, if, I, if, if, if it takes me leading the Kirtan for you to play Murdunga, then I'll lead the Kirtan. So, <laughs> so I led the Kirtan. But yeah, he is like that. The mood is so right, right? It's like he's not doing it to show and to be number one or anything. But when he sings, oh, man, it, it's so transformational. Beautiful. I think if anybody wants to hear his Kirtans, on SoundCloud, there's like, I, do they call them channels on SoundCloud? soundcloud or something like that but there's like a a soundcloud account or whatever yeah uh, that's called uh i think concrete it's called, jungle is it just concrete jungle or is it concrete jungle kirtan or something like that i'd, I'd have to look it up yeah. yeah but it's something like that Con- concrete jungle concrete jungle kirtan you get a lot of his his uh him and his sister achuta's uh kirtans there so also on uh radadesh mellows on youtube okay you radadesh mellows the... on youtube <laughs> yeah <laughs> So Ananta Govinda, that's his name. Um, so I was speaking with him and he was describing some experience that he had where he was like walking into a Starbucks or something and, and some guy just started chewing him out for no reason. He's like, you know, Ananta's a pretty big guy, you know, and, and uh, he said this guy was like five foot two and just came out and just be nasty to him for no reason. And, and he was in his mind, he was just like, you know, he was, he was describing it like this, like in his mind, he's looking at this guy and saying, do you want to get smacked right now? It's like, you know, you, you know, and then he said, but you know, and then he thought, and then he reflected on what he's meant to be, you know, as a Kirtan leader, as a, as a Vaishnava, as a devotee, what he's meant to embody, what he's heard from the Shastra, what it means to, you know, how this Trinata peace and Ichena, you know, how this humility and tolerance is, is what qualifies one for Kirtan. And, and so in that moment, he reflected on what he heard. And so this is that Gyana Tapasa. This is the fire of knowledge. This is how we go from knowing something. I know I'm meant to be humble and tolerant to realizing something, you know, f- mm. from Gyana to Vigyana, to the deepening, the maturing of that knowledge into what we call wisdom, that where you see the world through this, right? So it's exactly that, exactly like when, I, hearing is important. You know, hearing Bhagavatam daily is important. But the maturing of what we hear, you know, we'll gain knowledge from that, but the maturing of that knowledge, it grows through that reflection on it, particularly that reflection when we're challenged by the changing world. And that is the process of, of developing clarity, of developing spiritual clarity, right? Take the, the knowledge in, that we've heard, apply it through all the ups and downs in life, and it matures into applied by reflecting on it through the ups and downs in life and that w- and what is knowledge matures into wisdom that's how it becomes alive in our life and that's why the sangha or the 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 um our friends and our mentors become important because they're going to help us we lose our clarity we we get put in a difficult situation and then we turn to a friend or mentor and we say here's where i'm at and i'm thinking this and i'm thinking that and then they, from their detached position, right? Because our own attachments cloud our clarity. But because they're not in the same position, they can look at it in a more detached way. And they can help remind us on what we're meant to be reflecting on right now. And then you reflect on that. And then you, you, know, you make that uh, stand. You do the right thing even when it's difficult with the conviction that this is right and this is good and that this leads to deeper clarity. And... And then it matures in you. And we see that that's what happens in the Gita as well. You know, at the at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, um, you know, Krishna is going to turn to Arjuna and say, have you heard everything I've said with a clear mind, right? He says, kachchid uh, e tach chutam partha. Oh, Arjuna, have you, have you heard what I've said? 
you know, uh, with an intent. He says, uh, what is it? Tvayaika grena chaitasa. Have you heard it with an intentive mind? Right? Mm. Have you heard it well? I, I, I'm sharing with you the, the knowledge that you need in this difficult circumstance. Have you heard it well? Um, and, and, and he says, are your ignorance and illusions now dispelled? Right? Have you reached that state of clarity now? And of course, Arjuna uh, replies by saying, you know, nashta moha smitir labdha, that, that um, my moha, my confusion, right? It's, it's nashto, it's been, it's been destroyed, right? He says, my illusion is now gone, O oh, infallible one, O oh, Krishna, and I've regained my memory by your mercy. So that's clarity, right? I, I, I hear from the right source, I meditate on it, I, I reflect on it, I apply it, and, and then some clarity should arise. But now you're saying that in this day and age, boy, it seems like it's even worse than what the, the situation was. Arjuna was in the battle is like crazy, right? It's like there's all kinds of, you know, when you read Mahabharata, right? It's amazing. There's like days and days and days of battle going on. It's such a huge book. And, and, but even just like the battle part of it, which is just 18 days of like, you know, a, a long life, me, actually many lifetimes that are, you know, just generations are described in Mahabharata. But that battle goes on and on. There's so much description of what, you know, 18 days of battle and what goes on each day. And uh, sometimes, you know, like you get these like mystic fighters out there, right? The Rakshashas mm. and stuff. And they're throwing out all, it says like these Rakshashas, they can confuse you. You know, with all kinds of like, um, you know, with their mystic yogic powers, what, what what it looks like something and it's entirely something else, and in in a confused, you know, warrior will, will, you know, they'll just become completely bewildered on the battlefield. But like that, the the one that's like thinking clearly and seeing everything clearly understands exactly what's going on. You know, that warrior is throwing some kind of mystic illusory display at me right now, and I'm not falling for it. I'm gonna cut right through it. You know, so we have to be like that. But it is hard. And, and I'm going to say this just on the very practical level. I think I see, I do believe that we are in a time. And when I say in a time, I say like even the last five years, it's building up to like a, a head or something like that, you know, where I see people are really confused. And, and that confusion, you know that people are confused when they're always bickering with one another. Mm. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a clear sign of that we're confused. Um, we've lost our clarity. We're, we're not. We're not seeing the sacredness in each other. Uh, and Can I reflect a little something be, yeah. before you give the the answer. Um, I I was just remembering with regards to the Kurukshetra War something. I think Raghunath said this. I'm not sure where I got this from, but it said that in the Golden Age, uh, demigods and demons lived in different planets. Yeah. In the in the uh, Treta Yuga, which I guess is the Silver Age, uh, they lived in the same planet. And in, in uh, Dwarpa Yuga, which is when Arjuna and Krishna were around, they lived in the same house. So the, the Pandavas and the Kurus, they're, in the they're same part family. of the same family. Yeah. yeah. But in, in this age of iron of Kali Yuga, it's within our own mind. <laughs> the divine and demoniac. War yeah. Every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I love that statement. Although I've done some research and I haven't found any authentic source for it. Right, right. <laughs> it's passed around a lot. But but I think it is passed around a lot because it does make a lot of sense, right? It's like, yeah, there's a there's a a demon and a and a and a there's a sura and a sura both within me, right? There's a deva and a demon both like within me battling. I, you know, um the, the Native Americans had a had that saying, you know, like the good dog and the bad dog. We each have a good dog and a bad dog in us, and which one wins? It's it's such a great instru- it's something that Radha Swami has repeated in his teachings, right? But yeah. uh, you know, there's I, I we all feel it. There's a good dog in me, and there's a bad dog. There's there, there's that there's that part of me that wants to rise to my challenges in a dharmic way, and there's a part of me that just wants to surrender to my lower nature, um, whether it be in an active or inactive way, whether it's whether it's like doing doing wrong or not stepping up and doing what's right. Um, and so which dog wins? And the answer is the one that you feed. And so that is, you know, hearing Bhagavatam every day, chanting our mantras every day, associating with the right people, feeding it that way. We're so, and, and so that gets to, to what I was going to say, that why are we in such a mess? It's because of what we've been feeding. We've been feeding that lower nature pretty intensely. 
and the way that it's you know through media and technology it's difficult to resist you know so i would say that the confusion that i see on the worldly level right now i see it penetrated penetrating even within the community of bhakti yogis you know i i definitely see it you know there's more confusion mm. and more bickering and, and so on and i see really on you know there's two concerns that if we want to if we want to take these teachings and apply them today and find our own clarity that two areas that we need to be really careful around is media and technology um, mm. a, as well as political issues i think both these tend to cloud our clarity um you know social media um news media pornography these things are so widespread and their effect is so widespread that it has this very clouded and very confused I, I you know i was i'll speak in general this is in general i'm going to speak in generalities which is always a little uh can be touchy but I, I but it's also important i think i i think men and women are affected they're they're both affected in similar ways by media and technology but uh but also it, it can manifest in different ways with women i see that the the um the bombardment that we're getting through social media and through other forms of media it has them overly concerned emotionally with their bodies um and i don't say that um callously i say that sympathetically um that i i see it everywhere constantly i'm i'm hearing from women constantly about the pressures that they feel the emotional pressures that they feel regarding their own bodies and and um and i see that that same media is trying to inform them on how to deal with it but it's not giving the right formulas so it's it's like i'm concerned it, it's so you know even women that are externally very beautiful are concerned that they're not you know what to speak of ones that that have less you know what we would call you know uh what would you call beauty you know uh feel feel that pressure you know obviously just as much or more and it, and and the messages are coming just consider yourself beautiful no matter what anybody says on the physical level you know i know from shastra that that's not the answer that's going to satisfy that's that's not the cure but the cure is transcendental knowledge the cure is that we are all moving through different bodies all the time and some of them are more externally beautiful and some of them are less externally beautiful and every one of them is growing old and becomes less beautiful by the day and eventually just like deteriorates completely and becomes you know food for the worms in the earth <laughs> you know that that, <laughs> that we're all moving through these bodies and let me take good care of it let me keep it as healthy as possible let me you know there's no no harm in, in keeping it attractive and making it as is it you know as attract but don't become consumed by that uh and depressed by that and and how am i going to free my mind from that from that pain and that over concern it's transcendental knowledge it's truth you know it's the truth that sets you free so through that reflection that i am this atma that this body is not me um and 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 again reflecting on that as we go through the challenges in life one can become free from that you know so so i you know i sympathize with you know, it's not that men don't go through that as well but i think especially women go through that and then with men i think we have a very warped idea about strength and and we're very confused uh and uncontrolled when it comes to sexuality so we become callous and we become cruel and and those become the source of our own pain it it just brings pain back to us you know so men are they're confused by the by the examples that they see of what it means to be a man right and they and they they think it actually you know they we've become confused to think that it means being callous cal, be, being callous to women right like i'm i'm a, i'm an impressive man if you know i don't give a damn about women and, and their objects to me that i enjoy um or we're cruel to one another trying to you know prove ourselves in in one way or another whether it be you know economic cruelty right like how callous i can be in terms of you know i make money and you're a loser and i don't care about you and i don't care if you're suffering you know we need those examples and again that's why we need to read mahabharata you know that's why we need to read bhagavatam of like the strong man is the one that's caring for others you know the strong man is the one that's protecting others you know so i think the media and technology has us very confused 
you know, both men and women in, in the same ways and in different ways, you know, it's manifesting, but these, we really need to, to be, to be clear about, to, to, to recognize the effect that they're having on us, um, and, and be aware of it, see it in ourselves and, and rectify it. And then with political issues, you know, um, there's, you know, there's conservative and there's liberal, right? And when we're seeing dispassionately, we can recognize value in both, you know, um, and if, and when we can't see dispassionately, all we do is bicker with each other. You know, the generally conservative people, they speak for tradition. They want to preserve tradition. They see value in tradition and order, but, but it can go to the point where they become, uh, callous to those that are on the bottom of the thing, right? Like the, the, it, it can manifest in a way that lacks a little compassion. We need order. And then they apply that order in such a way that it, some, some are being hurt. Uh, and liberals, they want to speak up for the weak and they want to speak up for the oppressed and they want justice, but they're, they're willing to risk chaos for that, you know, lack of order. Now there's value in both, you know, um, other ways that it manifests are, you know, like should government be big or should government be, be small? And, and, you know, in the, a dispassionate person could see there needs to be a balance, right? If we're going to have a society that's going to work well, where we're going to have order, where, where the, the oppressed are, are, you know, are going to find their justice and, and, and all this, there needs to be, somehow there needs to be a balance applied. But what happens is, is that we, when we hear the other side, we don't actually hear we, we just immediately counter, um, and, and we're going, you know, we're, we're becoming polarized further and further and further polarized, uh, to the point where there's no discussion anymore. Right. And, and when we, and when we hear the other side, whether it be the other side be liberal or the other side be conservative, we, when we hear them speak rather than actually try to understand their position, even if it's coming out in a clouded way, even if it's, you know, rather than really trying to understand where they're at uh, and any value in what they might be sharing, instead we just identify them as the enemy and we respond with ridicule, with anger, and so on, and, and it just creates the further polarization. So I see both of those, you know, the, the effects of, of media and technology as well as the, the political environment as having, you know, a clouding effect, right? Um, it, it's we're losing our clarity and again the answer is going to be the same you know we, we we need to refresh our minds with the teachings of shastra we need to reflect on them as we go through life and and if we can do that we can move through this world with a kind of dispassionate clarity it's our passions it's our attachments that are clouding everything and if we can um if we slow down a little bit and we reflect on the, the knowledge that we've heard, uh, then we can gain that wisdom, you know, hopefully day by day, you know, it, it is a Mount Everest. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's another element there too, and that's mercy, <laughs> that, that Krishna is merciful. And as, we, um, as we're reflecting on the knowledge that we've heard and applying it in the different circumstances of our life, we're also crying out to Krishna. Just see how helpless I am in this sea of material energy. I'm just like this little twig that's out there on the ocean and I'm being one wave is blowing me this way and one wave is you know sweeping me in the other direction and I just need your shelter and Krishna provides that shelter in so many ways so it's a Mount Everest it's a challenge but uh, it's one that we can see by following the footsteps of these great souls we can we can climb it that, Bro, I just uh, <laughs> yeah it's super helpful and I, I think this is the the last session today. So I just wanted to express a little gratitude. I, I sent you 15 questions that I've been thinking about yeah, for the past yeah. year. And I thought even if we get one of them answered, I'll be happy. And I'm so happy that we got two of them answered. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. I really no, appreciate everything. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to do it. I, I, I have a verse here that uh, relates to clarity. Um, this is Srimad Bhagavatam 3933. And it reads as follows. Um, when you are free from the conception of gross and subtle bodies, 
And when you, oh, is, did I read this the other day? Maybe I didn't. I don't think I did. Okay, I when, you're, <laughs> when you're free from the conception of gross and subtle bodies, right? When you're no longer ruled by your body and your mind, and when your senses are free from the influences of the modes of material nature, you will realize your pure form in my association, and in that time you will be situated in pure consciousness. So that pure consciousness, um, that's what we're looking for, right? The, really, this this yoga practice is... You could, you could call it distilling the consciousness, right? That, that all the programming that's there in my mind, I'm going to boil it down, I'm going to boil it down, and all the impurities are going to, one by one, they're going to rise to the top. And then you can kind of just skim them off the top, you know, and, and get to this pure state of consciousness. When we, um, you know, we, we, we can feel it ourselves, you know, even if we're not always there, when we are there, we feel it, and it feels like such a relief when we're hearing from the right person. You know, sometimes you sit at the feet of, a, of someone that can speak uh, yogic knowledge, can speak Bhagavatam, can speak Bhagavad Gita in a way where you just, f you feel it and you know it, right? Because the clarity of their vision is being transmitted through their words, right? From one heart to the, to the, to the next. And you feel and you feel such a sense of gratitude and, and, and the clouds disperse and you see everything exactly as it is. I think, you know, some, I see Kathy here and Tina, they, they've just been on pilgrimage. And sometimes when you go on pilgrimage, you feel that. But then you got to go back into the world, right? So maybe, <laughs> maybe you guys are feeling that. You got to go back into your, your circumstances. Um, and, and then you're going to be faced with the same challenges. When you're out there on pilgrimage, you, you're not faced with those daily issues that, that cloud your, your, your clarity. Um, but hopefully you're going into it a little bit more prepared and maybe for the first week you're feeling different, but then, you know, you feel it start to, that you, your clarity start to slip away as the, as the days go by and that's okay. You know, that's natural. It, it, it's challenging, but then you need to refresh that. So you need to refresh that daily, but you know, I was able to dedicate, you know, a couple of weeks on pilgrimage. Now every day I got to dedicate a couple hours of my day to restore that clarity. And, and still it's, it's not as clear as when I was out on pilgrimage, but then uh, next year I need to go on pilgrimage again, you know, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to fight that battle again, but a little bit more strong, you know, a little bit more clear. And, and we go through this, you know, that, that's, that's how you get up that Mount Everest, you know, even though sometimes it seems like you're slipping back a little bit, but you keep up the process. You dedicate hours of the day, you dedicate days of the month, you dedicate, you know, months of the year, you know, to, to this practice. And year by year, you're going through, you know, your body's growing older. You, and if you're reflecting like this, your passions should be decreasing a little bit. And rather than becoming worried about that, we're welcoming that, you know. And as we get older, hold, hopefully each one of us becomes more and more that Stita Dear Muni, that's, that sage of steady mind, you know. We can do it. It's, it's just, uh, we just got to keep practicing. So thank you, Balaram. And thank you. Mary, you all queued up? There we go. So we got Bhakti Recovery today. What time was that again? Uh, noon. At noon. At noon today. That's mm -hmm. for both men and women. I think, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for being with us today. We Do we have Rugger tomorrow? We don't know if we have we have Rugger tomorrow or the next We day? think we do. Yeah. No, we're supposed to have We tomorrow. think we have Rugger tomorrow. So yeah. we're, we're looking forward to having Rugger tomorrow. Hopefully that will all work. And we should have good, he had a good connection there earlier, so it should be. Okay, yeah. So we'll bring Rugby back tomorrow. Uh, and it's still in Nepal. And then I think he has another travel day. And then hopefully he's, he's back for a uh, while. Back in the States. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Let's see uh, what everybody's doing here. Who's dancing? I didn't have a chance to look at the chat board today.